everyone, and welcome. This is George McAllister with MCOL, and I'll be your moderator. We're glad you could join us. Our webinar today is Reference-Based Pricing Research, Experience with Prescription Drugs and Procedures. Our first speaker today is Dr. James Robinson. Dr. Robinson is Leonard D. Schaffer Professor of Health Economics and Director of the Berkeley Center for Health Technology at the University of California in Berkeley. Also joining us today is Dr. Kathleen Donison, Chief Health Plan Administration, Division Benefits Program Policy and Planning with the CalPERS, the California Public Employees Retirement System. Before we get started, we just have a couple of housekeeping items. Our speakers will be taking your questions via the chat feature. While all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation, you're more than welcome to send your questions now and any time throughout the webinar. To chat, please click the blue talk bubble on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you'd like to receive a copy of today's presentation, you can download it from http colon forward slash forward slash healthwebsummit.com forward slash reference 100517.pdf. Lastly, if you require any other assistance, please contact the Health Web Summit office at 209-577-4888. Dr. Robinson, we're ready for you to begin. Thank you. Well, I am very pleased to be uh, with you all today and also to be joined uh, with uh, Kathy Donison. Uh, I am a research and professor here at Berkeley and study reference pricing among other, among other areas. Uh, Kathy is, is a person who does reference pricing uh, with the largest private employer uh, in the state of California, the uh, CalPERS. Um, and so we work well together and I think it's a good, um, it's a good mix and uh, I'm looking forward to her uh, part of this as well. What I'm going to do is talk to you about uh, really what is reference pricing and why do we have it, what are the results to date, and then with Kathy we'll address the broader issue of where might this go from here. I want to just start with the, the, the challenge, the fundamental challenge in the healthcare system is the high rising and highly variable pricing for similar drugs, similar services in, uh, without any particular justification for that. And uh, that's really what is underlying reference pricing to some extent is a, an employer and purchaser response to this unjustified price variation. And I want to just talk very briefly about that. In most sectors of, of, the, of the economy outside of healthcare, if there's a difference in price between two different services or two different products, it's because they differ in quality, convenience, or some dimension of performance that's valued by the purchaser. And so I'll pay more for a better car, but if there's two cars that are exactly the same, I won't, pay, I won't buy one that's more expensive than the other. But in healthcare, you see this remarkable variation in the price. Similar drugs have very different prices, and then out in the world of procedures, the same test, like an MRI or a colonoscopy, can be, have radically different prices in the same geographic market. How is that possible? And I think that it's due to, to um, factors both on what the economists would call the supply side of the market and the demand side of the market. On the supply side of the market, for the, for the, in the world of drugs and devices, manufacturers have both patents and they have various forms of regulatory exclusivity which, uh, which limit or altogether prevent uh, competition, and they uh, take advantage of that to raise their prices, and you see a, just a variety of uh, uh, remarkable price variation. In the world of procedures, you, and we'll talk about this uh, later, we, we now are witnessing a remarkable consolidation of the healthcare market in each local market as hospitals merge with one another, as they acquire uh, ambulatory clinics and employ physicians and uh, then have more market power. And then there's also factors on what we refer to as the demand side. First and perhaps most importantly, the average consumer has lacked the incentive to shop on the basis of price, to, 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 to prefer the cheaper thing over the more expensive thing, because somebody else was paying the bill. It was typically the insurance company or their employer or a public program such as Medicare. Uh, and all of us, I think, realistically, if, you know, if we're going out to a restaurant and we're choosing a restaurant and someone else is paying the bill, we, we just might you know, not worry so much about what it costs and go for what we think is 
convenience or quality or whatever. And then also, secondarily, consumers have lacked information about price and quality at the time of making choice. So that's really what's going on out there. And reference pricing is a response to that. And um, I wanted to talk about it and then talk about how it works both in the drug world and in the world of procedures. I'm going to use an example of colonoscopy. And these examples are from two different purchasing alliances, one of which is CalPERS and one of which is an another one, which we'll talk about. So first of all, what is reference pricing? Under reference pricing, the sponsor, I'm using that term broadly to include, it could be the employer, it could be the insurer, uh, is looking at these uh, remarkable differences in prices for similar s services and products and says, I'm going to establish a maximum contribution, sometimes referred to as a reference price, that I will make towards paying for, th for any particular service or product. And this limit is set at some point along the observed price range. In other words, I can, I'm looking at, in this, in this drug world, within the same therapeutic class, they'll say, well, we'll pay for the cheapest drug, and, um, but and we'll set all our payments at that level, or we might pay the median, or we might pick the 30th percentile, but somewhere in, the, in that range. And the patient uh, must pay the difference between that amount and what is actually charged. If they choose the cheaper service or the cheaper drug, then they don't pay the reference pricing extra. They, they are, they're protected. But if they want to pick the more expensive one, they can. That's their right. But they just have to pay the difference themselves. And I want to sort of make the analogy to this to what many of us who... Um, uh, who do some travel as part of our work, typically our employer will say, um, we'll pay up to a certain amount in travel, of your travel costs uh, per day. And so they might, it's what's called a per diem often. And then we might say, you will pay up to uh, $75 a day for meals and incidentals. And you can go to whichever restaurants you want, but we will no, not pay more than $75. Um, and that's reference pricing right there. Well, they'll pay 75 bucks. They've uh, estimated that, that for $75, you can get a decent uh, lunch and dinner in this particular city at this time. And if you want to spend more, that's your own dollar. And that's what reference pricing is. It makes people sensitive to uh, the price of the, of the service or the, or the product that they are picking. All right? So... Um, I'm going to now talk about uh, the application of reference pricing to, first of all, to drugs, and second of all, to uh, colonoscopy as an, um, uh, a diagnostic procedure. Um, and then Kathy and I together will talk about where might this all go. All right. So on the drug side, uh, everybody talks about drug prices these days. The, the reality is drug prices are high, and there's a lot of variation. And there's, there's variation at, at the time of a, of a new drug being launched. There's price increases after launch. And, um, and then I want to talk about uh, how some employers are responding to this. Just a few pictures just to make this visual. Here is the trend in launch prices. In other words, at the time when the drugs are first introduced, these are cancer drugs uh, over the past uh, 30 years. And uh, the scale, if you look at the vertical scale, it's on a logarithmic scale. So uh, each time, so the, 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 each time you go up a bar, the, the prices are doubling. And so basically it means that over the past 20 years, the prices have more than doubled at time of launch. And these are big numbers, you know, we're now in the 100,000, new cancer drugs are $100,000 or more per course of care. Here is another picture, which is price increases after launch. And these are some of the biggest drugs, the biggest selling drugs in the world, but particularly in the U.S. market. And we see that over the past five years, they've been steadily increasing their prices, and it's led to a, more than a doubling of a lot of these. These is Humira and Enbrel are the biggest drugs on the market for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and related uh, immune conditions. Uh, Capaxone is a, a drug for uh, multiple sclerosis, Crestor for uh, heart uh, conditions. Etc. And what we see is that these prices are going up uh, quite strongly, um, even though the drugs themselves have not changed. I mean, they're, they're, they're a molecule, and they're not changing at all, but the prices certainly are changing. Here's another picture. No, not, a, not a picture. Here's a graph. This is data from the RETA Trust. We'll talk about RETA in just a moment. This is what they paid for particular drug, drug classes. 
and what you the only thing I'm trying to um, uh, um, highlight here is the variation. Let's just take the go down three three rows. The ACE inhibitors they were paying between uh, six dollars and fifty dollars per month for ACE inhibitors. These are not list prices that someone was um, just posting. These are what they actually paid. Right? And you're going to go, how is this possible that they have such a remarkable variation in price? Okay? And then my last one before we talk more about reference pricing is, this is from a, an article in JAMA, which compares prices uh, in the U.S., prices after discounts, and then compares those to um, prices in Canada, France, and Germany. Now, everybody knows that um, very few people pay list prices for drugs in America. Some people do, but most, most um, employers and insurers get discounts. But even after the discounts, uh, you see that the prices in the states are uh, significantly higher. The first row, we're back to Humira. Um, and by the way, I don't want to say anything bad about Humira clinically. It's a good drug. It's a, very effective for the treatment of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. But the uh, list price is about um, $3,400 a month. After, after the rebates, it's about $2,500 a month in the United States, whereas in Canada, it's about $1,100 in France, uh, about $1,000 in Germany, it's up to $1,700 per month. And those differences are pretty steady as you look through the, these various other. These are all very big drugs um, uh, in the sense of lots of patients are taking these drugs, uh, lots of prescriptions, lots of dollars. Right. So this is the world that the, the purchasers, people like Kathy and other purchasers, are looking at. And they have, they have to pay this, and they're looking for ways of moderating their obligation and to make sure that they pay for stuff that is effective and that they don't pay more than they need to pay. All right. So let's go to uh, this study. This was a, a study that uh, I did with my colleagues here at Berkeley. Um, using data from the RITA Trust on their pharmaceutical reference pricing. The RITA Trust is an alliance of Catholic employers, mainly of dioceses, that, so they run Catholic schools and other uh, activities, and so they buy health insurance for school teachers, other school employees, uh, religious workers such as uh, priests and nuns, and other people who work uh, for them. Uh, and we had, they gave us access to all of their drug claims over about a five-year period from 2010 to 2014. And in the middle of that, 2013, is when they implemented reference pricing. And so this is, we did a study of before versus after, and then we compared that to data during that same time period from a, um, a labor union that, bought, that has uh, members who get health insurance and pharmaceutical benefits of approximately the same size. And we looked at our endpoints, so to speak, the probability that the patient selected the low-priced drug within its therapeutic class, the average price that was paid for a 30-day prescription, and the average consumer cost-sharing per prescription. All right. So here, let me give you a picture here. This is um, uh, the percentage of patients using these drugs, using drugs that chose a low-cost drug within their therapeutic class. And you can see that um, where reference pricing was implemented was uh, where the vertical line is, July 2013. And before that, the RITA Trust, they had a lower uh, percentage of patients choosing the lower priced drugs than the comparison group because they had a very generous benefit package. But after implementation of reference pricing where the patient had to pay the difference themselves, suddenly patients got a lot more interested in choosing the low priced drug within their therapeutic class. Once again, these drugs are grouped by class. And we're not, it's not like you're, you're moving patients from a drug for their disease to a drug for some other disease. This is within your condition. These are all drugs that are prescribed by your physician. Um, basically what it is is the physician switches the prescription. And uh, what was the effect of this on prices paid? Um, you see that, once again, the blue line is RITA and the red line is the comparison group. And RITA used to pay more, and then after reference pricing, it went down, and they didn't start to pay less. And also, I would just like to make the um, sort of obvious comment that, that what we see on this graph is prices going down. Not too often in healthcare that you see prices going down. Uh, usually, we talk about 
bending the cost curve, which means slowing the rate of growth. But here's actual price declines. We'll see that again when we get to the CalPERS experience with colonoscopy. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, those are just the, the, the raw statistics. We did, uh, you can use the, the citation for the paper. You can get the, the full paper if you get it from the journal, or you could email me and I'll send it to you. Um, uh, the results are the, so basically, um, a Controlling for everything, patient characteristics, market characteristics, everything under the sun. There's a growth in the probability that the RETA patients select a low-price drug. It's about a 14% reduction in the average price paid. There was, there was an increase in employee cost sharing because some employees chose to, uh, pay, to keep using the higher price drug, and that was their right, and that's totally fine. Um, and this saves money for the employer. I would like to make a comment, on, by the way, on that and reference pricing. Reference pricing is used in context where there's similar services or similar products with different prices. And the sponsor says, I'm willing to pay for the cheaper option, but if the consumer, the patient, wants the more expensive option, that's fine. We're not saying they can't have it. This isn't a mother may I type program. You have the choice, but if you choose the more expensive option, you will pay the difference yourself. Kind of like if I'm traveling for work, my employer might say, well, we'll pay up to the level, frankly, of like the Marriott or the Sheraton. But if you want to go to the Four Seasons or the St. Regis, that's fine, but you have to pay the difference yourself. And sometimes I may say, I want to go to the more expensive place. And other times, frankly, when I travel, I decide the Sheraton, that's probably okay for me. All right. Um, the question now, and we'll get to this later also, is can reference pricing be applied to specialty drugs? The drugs used, uh, studied here, these RETA, the RETA system, were for uh, common drugs, not cancer drugs, uh, not specialty drugs. And these are the specialty drugs, as you know, if you follow pharmaceuticals, is the ones which are very complex, uh, can be very effective against uh, difficult diseases, but very expensive. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, cancer. Um, and so leading employers that are interested in reference pricing right now are doing it for non-specialty drugs but are evaluating moving into at least some categories of specialty drugs and some categories of specialty conditions. And the, the big three there, the most obvious ones, are rheumatoid arthritis, growth hormone, and multiple sclerosis. This is already doing, being done in different ways. Reference pricing was really adopted from purchasers in Europe, particularly in France and in Germany. And, and in my other work, I do look, study the, their experiences to see how it works. Now, those are more single-payer type environments, not uh, multi-payer like we have here in, in America. All right. So now I'm going to switch from this focus on drugs to a focus on procedures. And uh, the leader here has been CalPERS and Kathy Donison as the leader of the uh, CalPERS initiative. Um, and it's a really a response to the changes in the marketplace. What's going on in the California marketplace, but pretty much everywhere across the United States, is consolidation. Hospitals are merging with one another to create multi-hospital, multi-market chains of facilities. They then, uh, these hospital systems are out there acquiring uh, ambulatory clinics, ambulatory surgery centers, diagnostic clinics, uh, drug infusion centers, and they're creating what they refer to as integrated delivery systems to try to, you know, cover the whole continuum of care. They are actively recruiting, um, employing physicians or purchasing physician practices and medical groups to incorporate that and to try to, to, to move into what they refer to as population-based health and better coordinate care. And a coordination of care is a really important uh, thing. It's good for quality of care and it uh, can save money. Um, however, uh, these, some of these systems use their consolidation and their leverage to uh, increase prices that are paid by the insurance companies and the employers and the individual enrollees. And so reference pricing is a res one response to that. I want to give you just here as a picture. These are CalPERS data. 
uh, before the implementation of reference pricing, so 2011. And uh, these are the prices paid by CalPERS for colonoscopy in California. So each, each dot represents the average price for all the procedures at a particular facility. So each dot is a, really a facility. The blue dots are hospital-based uh, outpatient departments that do colonoscopy. And the red dots are freestanding ambulatory clinics that are not hospital-based. And so we just arrayed them from the cheapest to the most expensive. And the first thing that, that jumps out at you at this, and we could have done this, we did this, we could show you this for MRI, for uh, knee surgery, for all across the board, is the incredible differences in prices. They range from below $1,000 to upwards towards eight or $9,000 for the same thing. This is quite remarkable. This is what CalPERS was actually paying. Um, and it was around this time, 2011, that they began to analyze their data more closely. They got a data warehouse. So they could really see these claims data. And they said, why are we paying this variation? And in particular, and then the second thing that jumps out at you is that the blue dots are almost, most of the blue dots are ab all above the red dots which means that hospitals are charging a lot more for this procedure than our non-hospital clinics. Um, and so what, what uh, Reference Pricing did, what CalPERS did, is they said, look at this, we really want to encourage patients to go to the freestanding clinics and centers because they're cheaper and um, we're going to look at make sure that the quality and safety is uh, the same or better. All right. So they put in a reference price of $1,500. They would pay, if you went to an ambulatory clinic, they would pay the charge. If, you went, if you're the patient, you went to a hospital-based clinic, they would pay the first $1,500. And you, the patient, would pay the difference. So our study, we did a study of this, which was published in JAMA Internal Medicine, and this is what we found, what happened. Uh, here is, I'm just, I just described what they did. So the first thing that was, uh, and we, so here we controlled the experience of CalPERS, and that's the red line, versus a control group of all the enrollees in Anthem Blue Cross of California who were not uh, part of CalPERS. Anthem did not in introduce reference pricing during this time period, except for they worked with CalPERS. So this, this slide that we're looking at is the percentage of patients who get a colonoscopy uh, um, over this period from 2009 to 2013, who uh, got it, what percent got it at a freestanding center rather than at a hospital based? And what you see is that before reference pricing, CalPERS patients were less likely to, to use a, a cheaper clinic, and that after reference pricing, they were more likely. They um, found religion quite rapidly when it was uh, their dollar rather than the CalPERS dollar that they were spending. Whereas there was no big ch changes at Anthem because there was no changes in the benefit design, there's a general drift towards more out outpatient care, but it wasn't dramatic. So here I see this as, to me this is, uh, you know, this kind of slide, what is the punchline here is, people are more careful spending their own money than spending somebody else's money. I mean, that's just, that's just a part of human nature. And uh, what reference pricing really does is says, the first part of this is our money, and the second part of this is your money, patient. And so you're spending your money, and you get to choose where to go. We're not telling you where to go, but we are giving you responsibility, financial responsibility. This picture is what was the prices paid by CalPERS and Anthem over this time period. If you look at the blue line for the Anthem line, what you see is the line that you always see in healthcare, which is prices are going up. Nothing new here, but when you look at the CalPERS, the red line, you, you see this remarkable change starting in 2011. The thing that happened in 2011 was reference pricing. And so the patients really moved to the lower priced freestanding ambulatory centers, and that meant that CalPERS was paying less, started paying less for colonoscopy than it had prior to reference pricing. And it had basically the same experience in, in its inpatient reference pricing for uh, joint replacement as well as for other outpatient uh, procedures, and Kathy will be talking about that in a few minutes. 
Um, we also looked at the rate of surgical complications or procedural complications for colonoscopy before and after implementation of reference pricing. CalPERS is definitely interested in saving money, but not at the expense of exposing their uh, beneficiaries to greater risk. And uh, this is the 90-day rate of complications uh, after colonoscopy uh, over this time period, uh, the red line, of course, being PERS again, and the blue line being Anthem. And so what uh, all we're trying to show in this line is, and we worked with this on some physicians to make sure that we had measured complications correctly, uh, and the details are all in the paper, which you can uh, access, um, that the implementation of reference pricing, uh, if anything, was associated with a slight improvement in outcomes relative to Anthem, although these differences are not statistically significant. And I would just uh, I would conclude that there was just no effect on quality, and there was a significant reduction in cost. And if value is quality divided by cost, then reference pricing improved the value of uh, colonoscopy services for CalPERS. Um, we also did um, some simulations looking, well, if just, and this is for colonoscopy, looking across the country, how much could be saved uh, if other employers um, implemented re colon uh, colonoscopy reference pricing across different markets. And really the, um, the, uh, the punchline here is that there's a lot of variation in what they could say, really depending on how high are the prices and how variable are the, are the prices. Some markets, like very rural markets, if there's no competition or no potential competition, you're not going to save anything from reference pricing unless you can, you can set up a travel medicine program where you um, help pay for the travel cost of a procedure of a patient moving, to, uh, taking, getting the procedure in a, in a different market where there's a center of excellence and um, they can get it cheaper. On the other hand, in, in markets uh, that are big urban areas, such as the San Francisco, Sacramento area, or Los Angeles, or uh, most of the major urban areas in the country, you see a lot of potential savings. All right, this uh, is this slide summarizes. We looked at um, reference pricing for a variety of surgical and diagnostic procedures, and I just want to just give you a little overview. Once again, you can get all this uh, in the medical journals where we published this. Um, but these are the results, and I want to point your attention to the second column, which is percent reduction in price paid per procedure test or drug. And I just want to just show just that uh, the variation is it, every time every time that reference pricing has been implemented, every different kinds of drug or procedure, there have been meaningful reductions in prices. There's been no exceptions to that. And so for our, the drugs, it was 14 percent for. For orthopedic joint replacement, there was it's about a 20% reduction. Arthroscopy, uh, the knee or shoulder, it's about 17%. Cataract removal surgery, about 18%. Colonoscopy, 21%. Laboratory tests, 32%. CT scans, 12%. MRI procedures, 10%. Uh, it's all in this range of about 10 to 20, at the upper bound, 30% savings. But I do note that, that these are actual reductions in price. We're not slowing the rate of cost growth here. We are actually reducing spending for these employers. These, these studies were done with CalPERS, for CalPERS, uh, for Safeway, and for the Rita Trust. Those are the three employers that uh, have uh, allowed us access to their uh, data for purposes of research. Now I want to shift to uh, the next question. This is where Kathy will jump in uh, and, and take the lead. Really, the, the big question was I like to refer to as the American question. Reference pricing seems to offer substantial benefits. Why, hasn't it been, why has it not been adopted more broadly? Or it could be adopted more broadly. Where are we going from here? And rather than speculate on that, I'm going to turn this over to Kathy, and she's going to talk about her thinking and her leadership at PERS. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for the invitation to speak with, with James Robinson. I, I want to talk just to, before we jump into some of the where are we going, I wanted to provide just a little bit of history and what was our intent back in 2011. We have been under, as a 
as a large purchaser now spending nearly $9 billion for 1.4 million uh, covered lives um, for both state and 1,500 contracting agencies. We, um, we've been challenged in terms of a very large labor component that um, looks at anything other than a standard benefit design or choice. Um, for example, a high deductible health plan as not being the direction that they, they thought that we, we should be going. So we have a, we have a very interested um, labor component um, to our purchasing for our health care services. And so we, within that framework, we have had to look at ways that we could, could uh, buy value, um, not just the cost component. And we describe value as having three components. It's quality, it's patient safety, and it's cost. So those three components to us combine to be the value proposition. And so as we um, looked at our data, and our data came from a data warehouse that we built in 2004, we saw this enormous variation, not just in the same cost of a procedure, or differing cost of a procedure, we also saw it regionally vary. So you could have a procedure in an outpatient hospital be two and a half times higher than a procedure um, in an ambulatory surgery center, and they could be right across the street from each other. So that was a, a localized geographic variation, but then we saw enormous variation in cost between Northern and Southern California. And in 2011, as we were bringing in the Affordable Care Act, um, we were seeing the potential for our premiums to go up um, as a result of some uncertainty into the market um, as the ACA came online, and we worried about um, our premiums and the trends of our premiums increasing. So we had seen this very large variation in our data, especially in the orthopedics arena. And we looked at the possibility of implementing centers of excellence, um, but we had also looked at the possibility of reference pricing hip and knee replacements. So centers of excellence, we didn't have enough in the state really to feel that we would have a broad um, a broad coverage for hip and knee replacement. So CalPERS and Anthem for our, our PPO plans, which are full fee-for-service plans, looked at the idea of re reference pricing hip and knee replacements. And we set the value at $30,000 for the device and the bed because we did not see the same variation on the physician side. But we did, um, on the bed and the device, we saw this enormous variation ranging from 15000 to 110000 and so for 2011, we implemented the hip and knee replacement reference pricing program. And it, it was interesting. <laughs> I, think, I think Dr. Robinson wanted to know exactly why we were doing that. And the reason we did it was really to try to stimulate competition between physicians and you know, the physicians doing the, the surgeries in the hospitals that were simply passing whatever the price was for that particular procedure onto the purchaser. And so we implemented and we saw an immediate drop in what we were spending. So we did it to com for, so providers would compete with each other and we did it so that consumers would understand um, the purchasing component and as Jamie said, they could choose to do it at a hospital that was above 30,000, or they could choose to go to the 45 hospitals we had identified that included Cedar sinai uh, University of California at San Francisco, Stanford. Um, so we had 45 very reputable hospitals that were part of this launch back in 2011. We also um, got in trouble with the orthopedists. They got very unhappy with us because um, if their hospital wasn't on the list, they couldn't do the surgery on the patient. And we were called on the carpet a little bit by the California Orthopedics Association. But w once we explained what we, we were doing, they actually served as our advocates to try to get their hospitals um, to, to participate in the reference pricing program for hip and knee replacement. In 2012, we'd seen that same variation. As I said, you could have this very same procedure, for example, a colonoscopy in an outpatient facility and across the street 
is an ambulatory surgery center, and so we, we implemented the reference pricing for colonoscopy, arthroscopies, and um, re uh, cataract surgeries. Now, now, the arthroscopies are a big cost driver for us. All orthopedics and uh, diseases of the musculoskeletal are, system are our number one cost driver. So it was very important for us to get the arthroscopies in there, which included surgical repair as well. And um, so we, did, we implemented that in 2012. And then we didn't go beyond that. And you might wonder why we didn't. Well, a couple of things uh, between now and, uh, and when we kind of stopped to evaluate in 2012 was that we could have reference priced 200 procedures. We could have reference priced ear tubes. Um, we could have reference priced just a number of different um, procedures, but we felt we needed to develop a framework by which to select what to reference price. So we paused. Jamie took his time for the next two or three years to evaluate our data and, to, um, and then start to publish the remarkable results that you see today. As we move forward, we also are looking at reference pricing pharmaceuticals. It's a huge challenge for us uh, to manage a pharmacy program. We, um, we, have a, we have HMO and PPO members that are part of our pharmacy benefit management company, and there's a number of different um, complications in terms of administering uh, a pharmacy program that includes outpatient, or retail and mail and specialty pharmacy. And so we think that the therapeutic reference pricing is a direction that we want to go in the future as well. We've also, we came back after we saw the results, and as we've looked at additional insurance designs for our PPOs, we have decided that, um, that, we, that we will expand our reference pricing to the ambulatory surgery centers. And there's also safety now. You can more as a result of, of technology and patient safety, more and more outpatient hospital procedures can be performed in ambulatory surgery centers. And some of the high cost uh, procedures for us, are, uh, laparoscopic gallbladders is an example. We spend, uh, the uh, gastrointestinal disorders are, are the fourth highest uh, spending category for us, so we are looking at all GI. Um, we, we have colonoscopy, but we're looking at all GI as well as other um, surgical procedures that can now be safely done in ambulatory surgery centers. We're also looking at medical pharmacy, which is a huge spin for us. Again, um, you can have a drug like Remicade, which I saw is on Jamie's list. Remicade can be infused in an outpatient hospital, it can be infused in a doctor's office or an infusion center or at home. And the home is the cheapest place for an infusion. So we're really looking at now not necessarily the reference pricing approach, but the channeling approach, with, again, working with Anthem Blue Cross to move the members out of the outpatient facility for this very same drug that could be accomplished in an infusion center, a doctor's office, or a home. So a lot of our work, and I, I want to bring this back to the American question around high, high deductible health plans, a lot of our work has been designing benefits that is, is um, compatible with the labor mission of ensuring care for its, its represented members, as well as retaining choice. So we stayed, on the, we stayed out of the murky waters of cost shifting, because that's what our unions think that we're doing when we do something like a high deductible plan or change benefits. Uh, co cost share is that we're just cost shifting. So the, this approach is labor friendly and it, uh, it actually gets to the heart of the matter of cost variation as Jamie said. So we actually ourselves, just in summary on this slide, and we, we set aside about five years between 2012 and 2017. We let the market change, we watched how it was changing, and now we're back um, again in the reference pricing arena. At the same time, we have three PPO plans that we are going to modernize 
and continue to use this, these tools plus others as a foundation um, to moving uh, forward with a modernization program for our three uh, uh, self-funded plans, First Care, First Choice, and First Select. So that's CalPERS story. And now we're going to move on to some of the challenges. Amy? Thank you, Kathy. Um, so um, I, I, CalPERS has been a leader in not only in reference pricing, but in, a, in in healthcare purchasing strategies more broadly, um, and uh, I do think it's it's there, it's interesting that they have decided that they want to now expand their their scope of reference pricing from the the procedures that they had started with that they kept with, but they didn't expand them for a number of years, and now they're moving into about another dozen diagnostic and surgical procedures and into um, the, the infused drug uh, bio, biologics and uh, chemotherapy, uh, and then possibly also into the pharmacy benefit drugs, the therapeutics. Uh, rest. So uh, the real question is, um, uh, will other employers and insurers pick this up or will they Will they not? Uh, that's still an open question. I think that right now reference pricing to be charitable is an interesting idea. It's been proven to work in some circumstances, but it has not caught fire yet in the larger employer uh, community, and that's really the question, um, will it and why not? Um, and I just thought these are certain possible uh, reasons why to date it hasn't um, uh, swept, the, swept the country. First of all is, is the breadth of applicability. Reference pricing really works for what we often refer to as shoppable tests and treatments, where the consumer has the time and the information to compare price and performance across different options. And um, uh, that's certainly true. You don't want to put reference pricing in for emergency services where the patient needs to go to the closest hospital emergency room. And it also doesn't work well for um, you know, primary care where they, people keep going back and forth to the patient, to the doctor, and, and you really want to have the doctor on some form of uh, population-based payment or something of that nature. But acute non-emergency services account for a very large share of total health care spending. When you've got all the procedures and infused drugs, these are, the, these are the, we say that chronic disease accounts for most of health care costs, but it's really the acute manifestation of chronic disease that accounts for most of the cost. And this is what reference pricing targets. Is there good information on price and quality? No, there's not. There's real gaps in that. It's a real issue. Patients are being asked to choose uh, without really good information. The information is improving. Um, I think that, personally, I think that reference pricing offers a better strategy for consumers in this environment than to simply giving the patient a high deductible health plan. Because with a high deductible health plan, the patient has to pay the first $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 out of pocket, and they can go to a website and look at prices, but that's, the guidance there is really limited. Whereas reference pricing always is of the following structure. We are identifying for you a list of hospitals or centers or drugs which are going to be cheap to you, and then all the others are going to be more expensive to you. But if you want to save money, we'll tell you where to save money. Just like Kathy was saying, when they launched the uh, orthopedic surgery reference pricing of the so 200 odd hospitals in California that do this, these procedures, they identified 45 that were charged less than $30,000 and had good quality, and they, they, they sent that list out to the patients. This is, we recommend that you go to one of these, but you can go to the others if you want. You will have to pay the difference. Now, over time, of course, hospitals have responded to that. Uh, a bunch of hospitals have approached um, PERS and said, can we reduce our price to get down there to that $30,000 threshold? And my understanding is that PERS says, anybody that wants to reduce their price to us, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> we'll, that's, we'll, we'll do it. I, I have a kind of funny story okay. on that, Jamie. Um, when the, 40, the list of the 45 came out, of course, it went to the orthopedist because we had to, um, we wanted to make sure primary care doctors knew about it in the Anthem Network. The orthopedists knew about it so that they uh, would know that if their hospital wasn't in the, if it wasn't part of the group, that, um, that, that they weren't going to be, we weren't sending the patients there. And so 
I mean, literally the response from the hospitals um, was very rapid in terms of, one, come over and explain this to us, CalPERS, because we're right down the street from the California Hospital Association. And two, uh, hospitals started clamoring that orthopedists, when they found out their hospital wasn't on the list, they be put, began putting pressure on the hospital to get on the list. And, um, and our, our, uh, the number went up from 45 to over 60. I think it went up to 70, and so it stays around 60 to 70. So we had an immediate response from orthopedists, from the hospitals, um, that was really quite refreshing because in 2010 it seemed like markets were never going to change. We were just going to be stuck with rising cost of care, dealing with variations in care, with, with really no, no future direction to go. Yeah. And I think that um, uh, the response of the hospitals to the PERS initiative was uh, twofold, for reason driven by two things. First of all, uh, CalPERS is the largest private payer in California, um, but even it's big, but still, you know, the reality is is that it's, there's still any given hospital, what percentage of their patients are from PERS, it's, it's not that big. Um, and so PERS is, a, is a, considered to be a bellwether purchaser, though. And that's why they paid attention. And then secondly, of course, orthopedic surgery is t often a profit center for hospitals. They really don't want to lose those patients. I remember myself, when this was all just rolling out, I was giving a talk at uh, an internal meeting of a hospital chain with about 15 hospitals in the state, and I had that list of those 45 hospitals. And uh, I just said, well, this is public information. Look at this list. And the, the, the senior vice president grabs this list out of my hand, turns and hands it to his assistant and says, I want you to fax this to, we were doing fax back then, fax this to the CEO of every one of our facilities, and I want each CEO to come back with me with their explanation of how they're going to get into the, uh, uh, that 45, how they're going to join that group, uh, because we want to be inside, not outside, of the CalPERS reference pricing initiative. It's quite striking. Um, we've got a few more slides here which we can go through, but I noticed that we're getting an accumulation of questions and we want to be sensitive to that and responsive yeah. to that. So why don't we turn to uh, the, the questions that have already been posted, and uh, I don't know how we want to address this. George, do you want to uh, prioritize these for us, or how should we do this? Um, did you want to just start from the top? I can read them out to you if you want me to. Okay. So um, I see one from... Uh, from uh, John McCracken saying, would it be feasible to establish a reference price for a bundle of provider services, um, like for an acute episode of care, and what would it take for the organization to be able to offer and post a bundled price? And the answer to that, I would say, is absolutely yes. Uh, that in fact the purchasers prefer bundled payment. They don't want to pay, let's just take orthopedic surgery, they don't want to pay one, one fee to the hospital, one fee to the surgeon, another fee to the anesthesiologist, a different fee post-discharge to the physical therapist or to the nursing home. They would rather have a you know, all-in 30-day uh, bundle or something of that nature and then they, that would make it actually easier to do reference pricing because you could say we're going to put a single, we're going to ask uh, the hospitals to bid or post their prices for, the, for all in, and then it will be that much easier for patients to compare apples to apples. Um, and this, we see this to some extent already happening out there. Some hospitals with their affiliated physicians are willing to go out to the market uh, and, and post a bundled price. Correct. Uh, I believe Hogue Hospital. Hogue, yes, in, that comes to mind. They're yeah, a leader. Yeah, Hogue Hospital, which is down in the Newport, uh, Orange County area, and they're the largest um, orthopedic surgery hospital in California in terms of number of procedures per year. They, they are willing to do this. They have contracts of this nature. And um, so th this is something that the, that the providers, by which I mean the hospitals and their physicians, need to work together on and uh, to, uh, and, and of course, not only price, but quality measurements so that they can um, uh, compete um, on both price and quality uh, with other providers.
Okay, the next one is uh, from Sarah uh, Singleton Wolf. I run a self-insured health plan with 12,000 covered lives. We're going uh, to reference-based pricing in 2018. Is it possible to get Kathy Dawson's contact information? And the answer is <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Certainly, I, I think um, I think our, our coordinator could provide that information. They certainly have my permission to do so. Why don't you just say it out loud right now what your email address is? Okay. Kathy.Donison, D-O-N-N-E-S-O-N, at calpers, C-A-L-P-E-R-S, dot C-A dot G-O-V. Okay, if I may say that again. So Kathy.Donison, at calpers, dot C-A dot G-O-V. Correct. All right. Here's one uh, from a Mary Davis. Can can you imagine how this would work to change the behavior of members who are captive in an IDN health insurance product? I'm assuming that means they, they, they get their insurance through an insurance company, which is a subsidiary of a hospital system. That is where the goal is also to drive patient volume to the owner delivery system. So if I may interpret that, um, this is where the employer or someone has selected a health plan which is owned by a hospital system, and of course they ch they channel the uh, patients to the hospitals and the clinics affiliated mm -hmm. with that system. Uh, now there's nothing wrong with that if there if there's competition at the insurance level. So, for example, at, in California, mm -hmm. we have a, a Kaiser Permanente mm -hmm. fits that bill. Kaiser has its, uh, its insurance plan, but it also has hospitals and its affiliated physicians. And uh, if, you, if you join the Kaiser insurance plan, you are going to be getting care from the Kaiser delivery system. And that's fine because Kaiser has to compete with uh, Anthem and with other insurance companies that have other providers. Uh, and so it happens there. Um, it would be a problem if in a, in a particular market there was really no choice at the at the either the insurance level or at the provider level. What do you say, Kathy? I um that's a good really good question. One of the things I did want to address if we had the time is we've we've done a lot of this work with the PPO, our self funded fully fee for service health plan. We're self insured, so we are literally the insurance plan. We did try it also in 2011 with hips and knees and with the three ambulatory surgery procedures in the HMO world, and it, it did not function well. And the reason it didn't function well was because it disconnected the, it disconnected the orthopedist for, for whom the primary care physician was directing the care to that orthopedist. And we spent a couple of years um, working with our health plan, HMO health plans, Kaiser excluded, uh, to try to, to shore up um, sort of the, the idea of reference pricing in an HMO. And literally, we decided not to try to go that direction with our HMO population, but to work more closely with primary care, directing appropriate cases to the orthopedist. In, in that instance of it sort of in those couple of years where we were working in the HMO world, we did find that there was a lot of utilization going on with hip and knee replacement. And once we did the reference pricing, it wasn't the cost savings, it was the reduction in utilization. But because we had disconnected sort of that primary care component, we actually look at our HMOs in a different way in terms of how to get the value proposition um, in terms of the premiums that we're spending with them. Yeah, and I, if, I pick, if I can pick up on that, in the, uh, in the HMO world, at least in California, the emphasis of the purchaser can be on, let's give the incentive, and the incentive uh, to the physicians, the primary care physician and the medical groups to direct care in a cost-effective as well as a high-quality uh, way. But on the PPR side, the patients are not bonded that well to primary care physicians and certainly not to medical groups. And so uh, reference pricing really directs the incentive at the patient rather than at the primary care physician. And then indirectly, of course, it affects the surgeons in the hospitals because they Correct. care about market share, but the, the, the focus is on, the initial focus is on the consumer. Correct. Uh, there's a couple other questions here which I uh, wanted to address uh, from Mary Davis. Is, uh, are there data for the reader study after the first two years? We haven't followed up on that. 
uh, right now, but we're just getting a new uh, grant. We've gotten a new grant, and we will be continuing uh, both the, the reader study um, as well as adding new employers. We also continue to follow uh, the CalPERS data, and we've gotten about a four-year um, post-implementation uh, data sequence on joint surgery, both on the cost and on the quality, and we'll be, of course, uh, presenting that first to PERS and then to the wider world because everybody cares about downstream uh, implications. Uh, there's another question. Uh, I was made that analogy to hotel per diems, and he said, "Well, you have the information to compare it, but how do consumers get information on price and quality?" Maybe I'll pass that one to Kathy. <laughs> uh, well, how do consumers get on, on price and quality in California? We, of course, have a number of different um, a number of different sites you can go to. The Patient Advocate has a quality. Quality Star ratings in terms of um, care delivery in California, but if you're looking at reference pricing specifically, we did employ the Castlight tool, which is a shopping tool, in terms of making sure our members. First of all, we had to have a heavy-duty communication uh, with the members, make sure that they didn't get stuck with a, a, a $30,000 bill because their surgery was $60,000 instead of $30. So we did a lot of communication and outreach. But we also have provided um, the Castlight search engine tool, which allows them to know about reference pricing and actually seek out where, where they should go for care. Um, if, if you're looking at the broader picture of cost and quality, that is, I think, still a challenge in ter terms of the cost component, not necessarily the quality component. Right, so yeah, and just to pick it up, yeah, there's there's a variety of uh, price transparency tools and websites, and often major insurers like United Healthcare they have it on their own website. Um, so the I would say that the information is patchy and incomplete Correct. and to some extent inaccurate, but it's getting better. And data will never get better until it starts getting used. And, and as long as patients felt that someone else was paying for everything, they didn't care, and so the data didn't improve. And then with high deductibles, the research to date on high deductibles uh, is that patients reduce their use of care, but they don't price shop they don't because they don't have any information, and so they just don't go to the doctor at all, or they don't get the test at all. And some of that's good, and some of that's bad. Um, there's, we don't want patients to use unnecessary and inappropriate health care, but we do want them to use appropriate uh, care, appropriate tests, and we don't want them to not get that test done just because uh, they've got a deductible. Um, so here's another question. Um, is there an entity that reviews or has reviewed and set reference pricing on drugs and rep medical procedures? And today, so the short answer is no. Uh, the, to date, the employers are, uh, those that are doing it, are having to do it themselves, typically with some sort of a consulting firm that works with them or an insurance company that works with them. Um, but if this scales up, um, it, ideally we would want, uh, it would be useful to have similar programs be adopted by different insurers and employers so that the the providers, the, the, the doctors, the hospitals, the pharmaceutical companies are getting a consistent message. Um, really what this is all about is an attempt to make the consumer price sensitive as a way of making the provider price compete. That's really what it's all about. In the past, the providers have really, they've competed on convenience and maybe on quality, but they haven't competed on price, and so guess what? We've got an expensive healthcare system. It's all sort of a no-brainer when you think about it. Uh, you know, you get the, our, our system is well designed to produce the results that it has produced, you know? And reference pricing is, is, is an attempt. It's one attempt. It's not the only one. And if we had more time, Kathy could talk about some of the other components of her value-based approach to re-engineering re purchasing at CalPERS, which includes reference pricing but includes other uh, components incentives and information and programs for patients with special needs. Yeah. Um, and, but it's all part of the larger effort to make the, the purchaser, that includes the employer uh, and the consumer, be more informed and more sophisticated and to have their incentives aligned to uh, produce 
both a, um, a high quality, but also a, an efficient and low priced healthcare system. So maybe on that uh, note, we will, it's now um, 11 o'clock, and we'll call it a day. Yeah. Thank you. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers and all of our participants for joining us today. We will be sending a follow-up post-event feedback via email before close of business today. And we'd love to receive any feedback you wish to share. If you haven't already done so, please be sure to join our LinkedIn group on the web where you can post questions, start discussions, and suggest topics for future events. This now concludes our webinar. Thank you.